Oi, oi, it's your boy, the Joanne Wood of only watching fights that are good, Jack Slack, and I am actually going to do that today because I'm having a mare of a week. Um, so I only had time to watch a few of these fights. Obviously, the important ones, not the Joanne Wood one. <laughs> but uh, we're going we're gonna to talk about, you know, the main event, the co-main event, and then a couple of others. Um, interesting card, lots of accusations of bias on commentary. Justin Gaethje was convinced that uh, Michael Bisping was terrible, and I was convinced that Daniel Cormier was terrible, and um, hard feelings all round, is what I'd say. Um, I think this one was a one that I previewed pretty well on the boycast, because I watched the uh, second fight, sorry, I keep forgetting this is the third fight, not the second fight, I watched the, the fight in Utah between Edwards and Usman the same day that I recorded the boycast, and I said, the thing that really surprised me was how bad it, Leon Edwards looked cardio-wise, from the second round. He gassed so quickly. Uh, and, and the way that I knew that was that he was just standing on the fence. He wasn't trying to move, uh, which is the number one thing you would be doing if you were against someone like Kamaru Usman. You know, I've watched his fight with Vicente Luke. He circles the cage well. He stays off the cage wall, uh, which is important when you find a guy who's plodding forward and hoping to counter you, uh, with you know, work with offensive counterpunching and batter you against the, the, uh, the cage wall. But in that uh, second Kamari fight, he just stands there and lets Kamari tee off on him. And I said, I'm quite intrigued by this fight because I think he gassed really fucking fast. And um, I think this fight kind of confirms that he did. I mean, I've been joking about it all week, but I really do hate fights at elevation, um, particularly in a sport where we don't pay people enough that they can actually go there long enough ahead of time to not be affected by it or to counteract the effects. I mentioned it before, but DC in their second fight was saying, oh yeah, everyone else on the card is gassed, but these two won't because they can afford to come here two weeks early, <laughs> which is ridiculous on a couple of levels. One, two weeks is not long enough to adapt to playing at elevation, whether you're playing football or basketball or whatever. And two, it's just pointing out that everyone on the card is kept poor by the UFC on purpose, to the detriment of the sport. It's like when Conor McGregor was saying that he'd done like a $500,000 camp for Dustin Poirier the third time or whatever. And uh, people were saying, that's ridiculous. And I was going, that's cool. I would like that. I wish everyone in main events could spend that kind of money to prepare to do a world-class job. Canelo can. Obviously, heaps of other boxers with world titles can't. But um, yeah, the, the second fight, I think the more I looked at it, the more I thought the elevation was a massive factor. And the more I look at this fight, the third fight, the more I'm convinced it was still. Yeah. And you can see that in Leon Edwards' movement. Go watch this fight and go watch the second fight. Leon Edwards in the second fight backs himself onto the fence, stands there covering up. And he does it from the second round to the fifth. And it means that Kamaru Usman can keep ducking in on his hips. He can keep teeing off with combinations up and down. And Leon Edwards will throw something back from time to time. But he's trying to play the counter on a guy who wants to smother him. And it's not working. Whereas in this one... He's kicking, he's moving backwards. He doesn't have the best ring craft and ring awareness in the world, but you can see when he's getting towards the fence, he circles one way, or, you know, he either circles out one way or he's fake circling out one way and goes back the other. Now, I understand we're going to have a lot of people in this week who aren't um, long-time slacky heads or long-time tech heads. So uh, just to tell you what I mean, when you're along the boundary of the arena, whether that's ropes or a cage or a pit in Soul Calibur... Uh, <laughs> There is an MMA promotion that does that, the um, Ganryu Jima. They have the moat covered in steam or smoke. But when you're approaching the boundary of an arena, if you get trapped there, your striking suffers badly. Your wrestling suffers badly, but your striking suffers badly because your feet are going to level out. You're not going to have the same power in your shots. You can't back away. You've lost one whole direction of... Um, well, it's not just one whole direction, you know... Good striking, there's a lot of moving back to the left and back to the right. It's not back on straight lines. So you've lost 180 degrees of where you could move to. If the opponent moves in on you and, and crowds you, you're not going to move straight through them. So you really only have the options of left and right. And then they can predict and try and cut you off or hit you with a good back kick as you go around or like a wide right to the body as you circle into it. So good fighters, when they begin to hit the fence or they're getting towards the fence or ropes, they circle one way, they change direction, and they circle back the other. And really good ones will do it three times. Or they'll do it once and duck under the punch that's coming. It's to draw something out because when you are circling along the cage, if the opponent's not close enough to hit you immediately, they're going to move in and they're going to try and cut you off. 
And if you can get them to do that and go ahead of you, which they have to do, that's what cutting the ring is. It's an anticipatory thing. You have to move to where the opponent's going to be. It's space invaders. You can then dart out the other side. Now, people who are really good at it, um, Dominic Cruz, Eddie Alvarez. You can pull up Eddie Alvarez's fight with um, Edward Foliang right now on YouTube. He gets hurt, and then he gets cornered, and then he circles one way, circles the other, gets out perfectly. His fight with Chandler the second time is another one full of examples. But this Edwards Usman third fight, tons of circling out when he was in trouble, faking circling out one way and changing directions back the other way when he's in trouble, and just staying off the fence much, much longer. I saw a lot of people saying Usman's knees are shot. I think Usman's knees have been shot for a while, but he was getting kicked in the legs a lot, which is something you should do when someone publicly acknowledges their knees are bad. Uh, no one was kicking Dominic Cruz's legs. Even when he's coming back from two years off due to knee injuries, people were not kicking his legs. It was insane. It's like this pride thing. You know, you're going, yeah, even, even before Dominic Cruz hurt his legs, his style was movement-based. I should be kicking his legs. But now that he's said he hurt his legs, I'm not going to kick his legs because that would be the unmanly thing to do. But basically, this fight was Leon Edwards going ham on Kamaru Usman's legs and body, threatening the head kick because that was hanging over this fight like a, uh, you know, like a spectre, and really landing much more than in the first fight at a great pace and with terrific accuracy. And this was insane because if you listen to Daniel Cormier, every round was very evenly fought. And the judges would have no way of knowing who won. <laughs> it's just, and I was watching that going, I like Leon Edwards as a fighter. I know, I, you know, I appreciate that he's fairly boring to a lot of people. Uh, you know, he's got a boring personality, certainly. But uh, I like watching him knee and elbow people. And I like watching him uh, counter good wrestlers. So perhaps I'm a little bit biased. I'm not biased towards English fighters. I don't really care about that stuff. But um, perhaps there is a bit of unconscious bias there, I thought. And then I looked at the stats. And he, he threw less than Kamaru Usman by a, a large amount. And he landed more than Kamaru Usman by a large amount. He was landing at 75%. That's the other guy not doing anything. That's not being able to avoid anything. Now, granted, a lot of those weren't headshots. Boom, headshot, or whatever it is we say. Um, headshot dead, that's the one. Uh, but you can't just not deal with low kicks and body kicks. And it did take it out of him. You know, his wrestling got worse and worse as the fight went on. His attempts became more laboured and further between them. And he wasn't able to get into the striking because he was just getting picked apart by kicks and then um, Edwards circling off. And as Edwards got more comfortable, he was able to step in on Kamaru with his elbows up. You saw him do those big uh, double forearms elbow blocks or uh, the bull guard from Letway. You, you put your, your, four, your elbows up nice and high. You get your chin down on your chest and you just go straight through whatever they're throwing. Um, you know, chances are you're going to get inside whatever they, they throw and you get into clinching range or long clinching range, which is collar ties. Um, and you start kneeing and elbowing. And that's what the United was doing from round three onwards uh, really successfully. And that's what I was hoping to see in the first fight. Because Sorry, the second fight. I'm going to keep doing that. That's what I was hoping to see in the first title fight because... Uh, Edwards is, has gotten so good kneeing el and elbowing people from the clinch, and Kamaru is constantly in the clinch. But we didn't see it in the second fight, we saw it in this fight. And it was Edwards in engaging in the clinches, for the most part. Um, Edwards fighting off the takedowns was impressive. Now, you got to say, there was a lot of fouling in this fight. <laughs> he managed to get one on every... You know, you're allowed one free one, but you're allowed one free one of every type of foul. <laughs> That's the way that's the way the the refing seems to work. So we had some dick kicks, we had a glove grab very blatantly in the first round, the inside the cuff of the glove. Um if you want to see the most blatant one ever of those, Dan Ige did a cross grip tripod sweep on someone while holding it like it was their gi. But uh Leon Edwards had Donald Sarani. Donald Sarani tried to do that to Leon Edwards uh, in their fight. Uh, Donald Sarani was beaten up constantly, getting roughed up in the clinch, and then in one clinch he just grabs the inside of the cuff rips away and tries to throw a head kick on the same side that he's pulling the arm out. And Edwards rolls it off his shoulder and looks at the ref like, come on. But it's a good move. And then there was the very blatant fence grab in round, was that three that he lost due to the point deduction? Um, or drew due to the point deduction? But uh, yes, I think that was very much the right call to deduct the point. Anytime that happens, anytime that you very clearly see a fighter um, their weight move as if they're about to be off balance and then they grab the, the, uh, their, their anchor on the fence stops them. You've got to do something about that. You've got to take a point. I don't care if the trip looked like it was going to be successful or not. 
if their balance was being affected and they changed the direction of their balance by using the cage or they stopped the movement of their bal- of their center of gravity by the movement by holding the cage um that should be doctor point because that is changing the fight through an illegal action deliberately i mean sometimes not deliberately sometimes people just reach out because it's a fucking cage and it's there um but yeah as we had this they had, we had this, we had this the other week big john mccarthy is now commenting on fights and saying that like if you didn't do it deliberately it's not a foul or if if you did something deliberately that is a foul and it didn't connect the ref can't warn you for it it's really fucking weird um the barzola archuleta fight archuleta tries to soccer kick him while he's on the ground he, uh, enrique barzola like turns away and it hits like a full pul- full punt into the forearm doesn't quite get his head and the ref warns them and Big John's on commentary going, no, he doesn't need to warn him because it didn't hit him in the head. And you're like, he he just tried to do an illegal move very blatantly. Yes, you warn him. Actually, I was pleased to see Piotr Yan get warned the other night for having his fingers splayed out towards Mirab Dvalishvili's eyes. His favourite move when he's under pressure. Anyway, so good amount of cheating from Leon Edwards. A um, little bit disappointing, but also part of the game. I think one of the interesting things in this fight, striking-wise was Leon Edwards' focus on the inside low kick, uh, Southpaw versus Orthodox, something you don't see all that much anymore. I used to see it all the time in MMA because guys just did it. You know, they were used to kicking the lead leg and they didn't really build off it very much. But Edwards was using it really nicely here uh, in combination with the body kick because there's about, you know, a foot and a half between the inside thigh and the body, you know, the lower part of the body kick. So it's a real good mix-up. The problem that a lot of people have with the inside low kick, uh, particularly the back leg to the inside low kick, is the inside low kick, most people stand in a way, uh, they tend to stand more comfortably able to check with their uh, knee and shin turning inwards than they do outwards. You have to sort of adopt that John Wayne style outward knee turn to be in position to check uh, kicks from the outside uh, comfortably or quickly. Most people in a boxing stance or, or something like a boxing stance get to the inside check quicker and easier. And because it's southpaw versus orthodox, it's back leg to front leg. It's a back leg attack, so you see it coming. It's a long, naked technique. But Edwards was playing the two off the off each other really well. Unfortunately, especially southpaw versus orthodox, if you're hacking away at the inside of that lead thigh the um, and the opponent's trying to move in on you at the same time, the groin kick will happen. I don't think the groin... You know, clearly the glove grab and the fence grab were deliberate actions that affected the course of the fight. I don't think the two groin kicks were um, deliberate. Obviously, I've just said whether a foul is deliberate or not does not matter in the grand scheme of things, but uh, that's just something that happens You know, when, you, when you're kicking the lead leg like that and the opponent's trying to move in. It'll happen. Uh, GSP against Matt Hughes did it like three times. That was step up inside low kicks, but same, same. And Usman did some valiant stuff, particularly later on when Trevor Whitman was saying, saying go forward and just stick to him. Um, the problem was that sticking to him off his uh, striking combinations was harder when uh, Edwards was moving side to side off most engagements and harder when he was getting confident in the clinch and throwing elbows and knees back. Got, uh, you know, Kamara got hit with a really hard knee straight to the chin in, I think, round two. So um, the threat was always there. And I can't say enough, but the the side to side movement and the fact that Edwards was actually doing it in this fight, was a huge game changer. If you go and watch the second fight, Usman's takedowns are not, um, you know, he's not an unstoppable, he's not an unstoppable takedown machine in terms of every time he tries, he gets the takedown. He's he's a guy who pushes you to the fence, recycles his takedown. It takes him a bit of effort to get you off your feet. I think uh, his official tally was like five out of 12 in the second, uh, in the second Edwards fight in Utah. In this day, in this one, he was down to four out of 15. And a lot of that was because he was taking worse shots. Um, he was tr- having to really pounce on Edwards when he saw Edwards was close to the fence because Edwards was doing so well staying off the fence. Uh, not even like super elite ring craft, just the act of always moving or trying to remember to always move. When he did get the takedowns, Edwards was really good at uh, springing back up. There was a lovely one in maybe three, maybe four. Edwards gets taken down fully uh, out in the open, half guard, Shrimps away, gets his knee shield in, puts in the the low knee shield, the Z guard, the hip clamp, whatever you want to call it, uh, switches to a butterfly hook and immediately uses to, it to get up. The butterfly half guard, so useful. Um, it's you know, Gordon Ryan was the first guy really making use of it and 
showing everyone that the heart, butterfly half guard is basically butterfly guard, but also basically half guard. You get all of the good bits with very few drawbacks if you're using a butterfly half guard. Though there was some really nice butterfly half guard passing uh, earlier on the card in the Shaw Amakani fight, which we'll talk about in a minute. But I thought that was a really good get up by Edwards. Um, yeah, I mean, he is. I think I've said it before, but he's easily the most skilled fighter that um, Britain's ever produced. I said that before his title shot. You know, I love me some Michael Bisping. I think he's an incredibly important guy. I think he did great things and I enjoyed him. But uh, his, you know, there's a, there's a thing about like getting lucky with title shots and title fights and when you win titles. But everyone is uh, victim to, you know, luck of the draw and scheduling. He turned up, knocked out the guy he was supposed to on that night, uh, won the belt. But there is always that sort of um, asterisk. It was a very lucky occurrence. The stars aligned for him when he'd sort of passed his prime. And it was assumed that he was done being a contender because he'd lost to people like Tim Kennedy and Chael Sonnen and Luke Rockhold, of course. But with Leon Edwards, the, this talent was always very clear. He's one of the best clinch fighters in MMA, full stop. Um, and, he, you know, he's doing it without any... Uh, traditional wrestling pedigree, no wrestling background. He just has a brilliant clinch, striking takedowns, reversals. You know, a, a lot of his uh, surprising moments have come when the opponent tries to clinch him and he either gets the head post and whacks him with an elbow or a knee or uh, he pummels and gets a body lock and attempts his own takedown. You know, that, that takedown to mount in the first round of the second fight, that was off a, a Kamaru position of advantage. He just turned it around and, and um, attacked him. And his striking's pretty serviceable. You know, it's it's not super diverse, and he's not great in combination. But he does understand uh, movement and ring craft, and he does understand feints and how to play with people's expectations. And that is more than enough to be a very difficult man to beat for good technical strikers. And his distancing is excellent, which was the thing that really, you know, that and the ring positioning were the things that really made me think that the altitude, sorry, elevation, whatever, uh, fucked him up in the second fight. So what they said is next for him is Colby Covington. That is daft. Colby Covington hasn't won a fight since 2019, I believe, or something like that. Let me check. Hold on. Oh, no, he won a fight against Jorge Masvidal in uh, March 2022, but two losses to Kamaru, and then wins over like Tyron Woodley, Robbie Lawler, both old men, Rafael Dos Anjos, an old man and a lightweight, Damian Meyer, an old man. You know, he's just been running the table of old men, and he's like 35 now. So uh, the reason they're doing this, if you don't understand why, it's because Leon Edwards, no matter how popular he is in England, um, the way that it works is that we don't have proper pay-per-view in the, in the same way that the Americans do. Um, we have it through BT Sport, and BT Sport will sometimes say that uh, most cards are included, and then sometimes they'll say that card's too bad to even bother with. <laughs> That happened with a uh, Apex one a little while ago. They just didn't upload it. I think they had the rights to it. They didn't upload it to their app, this is. And um, the other one is if it's a big, big name in Britain, they'll try and put it on pay-per-view. So they used to do that with Conor McGregor. That's how this started. And most recently before this one was uh, Oliveira versus Makachev they managed to put on pay-per-view. Uh, I don't think they put Volkanovski versus Makachev on pay-per-view, which is weird because you'd think that was a bigger fight. But anyway, they put this on pay-per-view, but pay-per-view, I'm putting that in inverted commas, is, uh, or quotations, is £20 in the UK, which is $25, $30. The UFC's revenue is based heavily, heavily, heavily on people who don't know about pirating fights in the US, uh, people who are willing to pay $80 to watch a pay-per-view. Do those people give a shit about a British champion who doesn't talk much and doesn't knock people out and has a very technically good but not super entertaining style. No. <laughs> Do they care about seeing him fight Bilal Mohammed, a guy who has an even more boring style? No. So what they did was they slapped together this Covington fight because at least Covington's going to bring some ruckus in the press and um, weirdos who are stuck in the culture war era of three years ago are going to love it. Excited to see how Colby Covington spins this into like a Make America Great Again thing when it's a British champion. <laughs> it's, not like, it's nothing to do with America. But um, yeah, that's why that's happening. Uh, Gilbert Burns is obviously the logical contender. Uh, Kamsa Chimaev, they said they want to make him fight at middleweight, which on the one hand, he's clearly a good, a very good 
welterweight who could fight for the title. But on the other hand, they made him a whole event for himself to showcase him. And he screwed the pooch and missed weight or, you know, was was missing weight so badly that the doctor intervened and stopped him from uh, cutting weight. Shavkat Rachmanov is another one that you could possibly do. I think that'd be fantastic because that's the two guys in the division who can actually clinch strike really, really well. But again, people don't really know who he is. Covington is at least, I mean, people in Britain know Leon Edwards. They'll buy some pay-per-views to some degree, but people in America do know who Colby Covington is. They'll buy some pay-per-views to some degree. This is probably the best sale you can get out of a largely uncharismatic champion in a division full of... um, quiet, unknown, dangerous people. So then the co-main event was Raphael Fizier versus Justin Gaethje. And I'm going to say I had a completely, uh, I misread this one totally. Uh, I looked at his fight with Chandler and I thought Justin Gaethje seems to be stagnating. Uh, He fought really dumb in that one. It was so, Pat Wyman alert, wrote, it was just the same shit over and over again. Jab, cross, hook, jab, cross, hook, jab, cross, hook. Uh, The odd uppercut. The odd low kick. But it looked like they had no read on their opponent specifically. Um, and it looked like he was just there kind of doing old Gaethje things. Especially once Chandler decided that he wasn't going to win, but he was going to make a scene and, and pump the crowd up and do all that shit that everyone hates. Um, but in this one, I was my tits were blown off. Uh, I know this one was a controversial decision, but I just can't get past the prep that they managed to do for Rafael Fiziev specifically. With Justin Gage, who I, you know, I was looking at going, well, he's really just got the same few things over and over. But, um, you know, Rafael Fiziev, one of the things that he has is the left high kick and the left body kick, and particularly the switch left kick from Orthodox. Think how much the left body kick and high kick mess people up from southpaws, and then think how few guys in MMA can do the switch body kick and head kick from Orthodox. Um, Fiziev has weapons that people don't use in MMA, and they are tricky especially the speed on that switch and also the the ground that he can cover while doing a switch rather than just a step. Very impressive. But within about a minute of this fight, Fiziev does his switch step and covers some ground to do the the round kick to the body. And Justin Gaethje steps in, left hook, pivots round offline, um, very similar to that, the old Tai Sabaki, the the one that you'll see Kyoji Horiguchi, Robert Whittaker. um, Who else did it? There's a couple of famous examples. Oh, um... Patricio Pitbull against Emmanuel Sanchez, I want to say. Um, you know, stepping... As the opponent steps up into the left kick, you step towards them and slide down to the left and hit him with a jab or a left hook. Gaethje did it, pivoted, pulled his head away from the right hand that followed. It was beautiful. And I went, oh! Because that shit you're only going to be doing if you've been training specifically for that. For that left body kick, left high kick, for that switch kick, specifically for this opponent. And and the moment I saw that, I went, oh, they might have some interesting ideas in this fight. They, they prepared specifically for this man. So some of the things I really liked, uh, dealing with the left round kick to the body and the head, the switch kick, uh, and also from Southpaw Fizzy, I went a couple of times, uh, actually more than a couple of times in this fight. One, stepping up the inside with the left hook and pivoting off and pulling away, knowing that the right hand was coming afterwards. Beautiful. You saw it on a couple of occasions in this fight. Two, parrying the kick across the body. You saw that a few times. He wasn't able to get off his low kick encounter or anything like that, but he did manage to um, to parry the kick and threaten to return, which is good when this guy's kicks go in, you know, uh, almost unresisted against most opponents. And three, one of the big things that made the difference, lateral movement. Again, another example of lateral movement, but this time it was Whitman's fighter on the delivering end of the lateral movement. Um yeah, turning Fiziev made it very hard for him to uh, to throw up the kick. And you saw this from very early on. Uh, Gaethje would start stepping one way and then go back the other way. And uh, you saw it with the, the fake into the run-up with the low kick. That was really nice right at the start. But then he'd start circling and he'd, go, he'd take a step to his left and then step to his right and leap in with a, a right hook. Um, he was doing this throughout the fight, just little side steps and then entries. And it worked really well. Most upright I've seen Gaethje, to be honest. He was he was very upright and short in his stance. He looked like he was ready to deal with kicks. Um, you can't be hunched over trying to deal with kicks because you, you're going to get chewed up, you're going to get lifted out of your stance when you get kicked on the arms, and um, you can't get back in as quickly. Now, that's not to say that he became a, you know, he fixed everything that was wrong with him ever overnight. He's still throwing his right hand and leaning well forward after it. Um, he's still, I was very surprised by the lack of uppercuts from Fiziev. 
because Justin Gaethje, you know, there's there's bobbing, which is where you bend at the knees, and there's weaving, which is where you bend at the waist. And most people, most of the time, are doing sort of a combination of both. But Justin Gaethje really does just he he hinges at the hips to get under punches. He bends over like he wants to bury his head in the sand. Um, and it would ma- it makes him a sucker for the uppercut. Eddie Alvarez gave him hell with it. Poirier gave him a really hard time with it. It also meant that Eddie Alvarez could grab his head and knee. You know, if you if the guy's already bringing his head down, just slap both hands over the top. You know, whether you're calling it a tie plum or just grabbing his fucking head, um, you're going to be able to knee him because he's broken his posture for you. I'm not saying that it's always wrong to do that. You know, big favorite of mine, KJ Noons, did that tons. Came up with left hooks and right hooks from the weave, but. It is something that you can read when you do it as regularly as uh, Justin Gaethje and reliably. You know, it's a it's something that he does in answer to people attacking him, so you can make him do it, and then you can uppercut him when he's doing it. Or knee him. Uh, Viziev's knees in the clinch were really nice in this one, some really nice knees to the body. While the left kick was being dealt with well, I thought for the most part, he did also land a lot of them. Gaethje himself not landing to the body very much at all. Fiziev, obviously, a big body hunter. He uh, he scored 52 of 61 body strikes in this one. Wow, that's a lot higher than I thought it would be. Um, and Gaethje uh, landed 14 of 15. So they went in undefended, but he wasn't throwing an awful lot of them. Majority of Gaethje's work was to the head, punctuated by the odd low kick. You know, he's got the kind of low kicks that make people change stance immediately, as it did to uh, Fiziev here. It's another one of those things where people were confidently saying for ages that if you get a good, experienced kickboxer in there, they're not going to be going down to one low kick, you know, one calf kick or whatever. And then they are. They are getting busted up by single calf kicks. And it's happening in kickboxing too, in J-kick. There was another one stopped by a single calf kick the other day. Yuki Yoza, uh, who I was raving about, won, a, won the fight before last with a, a good calf kick. He distracted the guy with kicks to his back leg, threw a good calf kick, buckled the guy's knee. Guy took the eight count, next kick, went down immediately, end of the fight. But yeah, the, the low kicks, while they were few and far between from Gaethje, um, well, they weren't few, you know, 15 is a good amount of low kicks, but the ones that landed really did seem to bother for Ziev. What I did like and what I was talking about in the pre-fight was, one, actually attempted takedowns, a couple of them, um, and succeeded on his, in his attempt in the third round. But two, the level change into the uppercut, the level change into the collar tie into the uppercut, I, I love. And you saw a lot of the jab and dip from Gaethje in this one, which I really liked. His jab in the third round was really successful. But before you can start putting the jab on someone's face, what you can do, uh, a great example that I'm always using is, is uh, Roberto Duran, who was doing it to younger, taller, longer fighters. He would jab, and he would jab to like the end of their nose. You know, he was never going to hurt him with the jab, but he'd jab and he'd immediately dip down after it. Because he knew if he threw a jab out at someone, a young, top of their game fighter, they're going to be throwing back immediately. So jabbed and dipped, and then he'd be throwing body shots because he could close as underneath the opponent's return. And you saw Gaethje do that. He jabbed and dipped and uh, came in chest to chest, grabbed behind the head with his left hand, and threw the uppercut. And uh, this really... There was a couple of examples of this. Uh, Leon Edwards did it too, but from, going from punching to grabbing is a really useful skill that you don't see enough. It's a huge area of MMA that should be uh, cultivated more, I believe. But uh, if you are a Patreon boy, go check out the Advanced Striking 2.0 study on Tommy Lochran. He's a weird guy. You won't have heard of him. He knocked out something like 17 of 200 opponents he had in boxing. Not going to be registering on most people's uh, highlight reel viewings. You know, that's how he's, that's how most people discover old boxers. They go through highlight reels and they're like, nice, loads of knockouts. Um, Tommy Lochran had this crazy style where he stood almost side on, only through jabs, and as he jabbed, his his right hand would go forward at the same time onto the opponent's lead hand. And then from that jab, where he covered the opponent's lead hand at the same time, he would go to both their biceps, or he'd go to one of their biceps and behind their head, and then he'd hammer them with the uppercut while holding the back of their head. And the uppercut while holding the back of the head is such a powerful punch. It really hurts people. And he was not known as a puncher. And you can watch the, some of the film that he had. It, with people like Jim Braddock, who was a very good fighter, uh, Jim Braddock was going to be like the next light heavyweight champion of the world, had to fight Tommy Lochran for the title, lost because Lochran was just incredible, and uh, then went up to heavyweight as an old man and surprised everyone becoming the Cinderella man, becoming the heavyweight champion of the world. But uh, Lochran just handles him. Braddock could bang, and Lochran was not known for it, but, but because Lochran was grabbing him behind the head and smashing him with uppercuts, he really was surprised by it. 
Um, and yeah, sorry, Gaethje's, one of Gaethje's best moves is a level change, come up with the uppercut, but grab behind the head at the same time. And what you saw in this one, he was able to jab and grab off it, jab and grab, really like that. It's a quick movement because you've got to go from striking to just grabbing a hold of something with the same hand off the same movement, basically. And then land the uppercut and then an elbow or a, or a right hook over the top. Um, or he would throw this slappy, this long slappy left hook, which he was landing a few times, but then if he could get closer and miss it, he could grab straight into the collar side, which I really like. That was something Ronda Rousey used to do. Um, back when everyone was obsessed with claiming she had really good striking, <laughs> you know, she did have actually one move, which was left hook into collar tie. But I really loved that. The jab, dip into the opponent's chest, come up with the right uppercut. You can do it naked, which, um, not naked, sorry, you can do it without holding on, which is what Jack Shaw did to Emma Carney uh, a couple of times. Or you can grab a hold behind the head because it's MMA and you might as well. If you if you don't grab behind the head, you can come up with the right uppercut and then the left hook or the right uppercut and the left jab to push him back out to range. If you grab behind the head, you go right uppercut and then you hold him in place and you go right overhand or right uppercut again or right elbow. It's an area of MMA that is completely unexplored. Get in that collar tie using what we call long clinches. Short clinches are things where you're like chest to chest with the opponent. Long clinches are things like the collar tie. And then I'd say maybe things like um, two on ones where you're holding, uh, you know, either a Russian two on one or a head outside two on one, which are very rare in MMA, but they're longer clinch positions where you're not stuck against the guy. And you can, you know, you've got some distance to strike off it. And then his jab, uh, Gagey's jab really did start doing work in the last round. I was very surprised by that. Uh, years ago, I was saying, damn, if, J if Gaethje put in some effort and learned to jab, uh, he could be a force. But uh, I was always thinking, learn the jab in the course of getting in to land this uppercut, getting into the land overhands and things, but uh, never as like a, a needling someone's face open jab. And he, he did very well with it in this one. So yeah, I was super impressed by that. And then afterwards, he was like, uh, Michael Bisping was unreasonably biased on commentary. Kamaru Usman was the man, blah, blah, blah. And he'd be like, Oh, yeah, I just remembered every time you open your mouth, you say something daft. But still, one of the funnest fighters in MMA. And, you know, Fiziev did, you know, did not disgrace himself here. It was a majority decision. A lot of people th felt that he did enough to win. He was landing plenty of body kicks. Um, you know, it was just the, the specific counters to the body kicks and his sort of wide swings made him look a lot less accurate than he usually is and made him look slower than he usually is. I don't know if he was slower than he usually is, but when you see some, it's like when someone steps down the side of a back kick. If you know the back kick's coming and you step down the side of it, the other guy looks like a complete mug. And it was the same with this. When he was stepping down, the, he was stepping up the inside of the, the left body kicks and left high kicks. And you're going, oh yeah, well, saw that coming. Fiziev was also sort of kept from working in combination as well as he usually does. If you watch his fights with the guy like Moicano, where he's throwing three punches and then a double kick you know a left low kick left high kick at the end and you're going damn how does anyone stop that buzzsaw and the answer is you be Justin Gaethje and you hit like a fucking truck because <laughs> people don't want to stand around doing combinations if there's the big threat of that ever-present right hand and I think that's the thing with Gaethje he's, he's probably never going to fix some of the fundamental issues in his game that's really over leaning and especially with his right hand throwing his head out there afterwards but in this division there aren't many people who, I don't think there's anyone who hits harder than him when he's when he's on. It's just that he also spends a lot of time missing. And he, you know, has z places zero value on bodywork at all. <laughs> I haven't seen everything on this card, but a couple of other things I saw. Gunnar Nelson versus Brian Barberena. Nice to have Gunnar Nelson back. Nice to have a submission. Um, basically, another quick clip for the, for the Gunnar Nelson punch and clutch high highlight reel. He stands in either open guard or closed guard, but with his lead hand... He's checking, he's swatting at your hands, and then he throws his rear hand, biffs you on the nose, and then it, that hand stays on your face as he's stepping in behind it. He smashes in chest to chest, and that hand becomes an underhook. Suddenly you're in a clinch with him, having been hit in the face, and he's working away. Uh, in this instance, he didn't hit like an immediate trip. He hit the fence first, but he uh, did the lock the hands under the taint, lifted him up, threw him off the fence, got on top, smashed him, uh, got into the mount, did some really nice work from mount, loved it. There was an interesting bit where he was in half guard, but it was half guard where he was hooking the leg. Brian Barberena was like, please let me roll away because I want to stand up. And Gooden Nelson, rather than trying to pass, was hooking the leg with his leg. Um, and then later he advanced to mount. But uh, the elbow was really nice. He used the elbow to sneak up into S mount and get a great armbar. You know, you don't see an awful lot of armbars like that. Uh, Gordon Ryan hits a few of them in pure grappling. But certainly not in MMA do you see people going for armbars from the mount. It was like having Paulo Filio back for a minute. 
Paulo Filio was a monster in pride. And in like 15 fights, he won basically every single one by submission. And he won like 70% of those submissions were uh, arm bars from Mount. Very scary dude. And then he had that insane fight with Chael Sonnen where he was fighting ghosts. He was hallucinating during the fight. And you can see Chael Sonnen circles around him and Paulo Filio's eyes stay where Chael Sonnen was. It's very weird. Then the other big one that I saw was Jack Shaw versus Malkwana Makani because you know I had to watch. Yeah, you know I had to do it to him one time. Oh my god! You know sometimes I joke about things and I make them more dramatic. You know I, I go over the top. I use hyperbole for humour, and then people get angry at me on the internet. Like he said that all Valentina throws is a lean back right hook, yet clearly here she throws a left straight. Um, you know that's hyperbole for dramatic effect, and you know making observations about people's styles in a flippant way but Makwan Amakani I say he gasses the moment it hits the second round he really does fucking gas the moment it hits the second round I don't understand how you can be a professional fighter for well let's not even say professional fighter he's been in the UFC the highest level of professional fighting since 2015 and his conditioning is still dog shit you know there are you'd have to have so little self-awareness to not be able to watch these fights and go, oh, I can see what's going wrong there. You know, he's in there feeling it. It's clear when he comes off the stool for the second round and he's already puffing that he's having trouble. You know, the most obvious one is the Lerone Murphy one. Um, Lerone Murphy gets taken down and dominated for round one, comes out for the second round, Amakani's already puffing and uh, shoots a really bad shot straight onto a knee. Same in this one. He comes out against Jack Shaw. He does the two things he does really well on the feet. The southpaw lead hand uppercut, which pairs really nicely with dropping on the legs. It's very cool. You know, you can watch his fight with Edson Barboza, one where he didn't actually gas that fast, and uh, it worked really well for him. But then the moment the second round comes around, he's shooting from miles out. (laughs) It's just absolutely desperate. Because he got on top of Jack Shaw early in the first round. He held top position for the entire round. Uh, Jack Shaw was doing a great job of using... Uh, his butterflies and uh, his guard recoveries to to push Amakani back to guard. Amakani wasn't landing strikes. Amakani gassed out trying to pass, which is incredible. He comes out into the second round. Uh, Firstly, Jack Shaw's dad in his corner was great. He goes, uh, we've been working on a high kick for six weeks and you haven't thrown one. (laughs) It's just such a great way to shame your fighter. So he comes out, immediately throws two high kicks, uh, dings Amakani off the head. And Amakani throws up a high kick of his own and falls on his ass. Um, and then Jack Shaw gets on top of him. And then uh, they get back up and Jack Shaw head kicks him again. Gets on top, gets the rear naked choke. But the just the tiredness of Amakani in the second round, I'm not just saying it. He's useless in the second round. He's standing there with his hands down by his waist, wanting to bend over and, and like lean on his haunches. He's puffing. And every time he gets every time they engage, he gets hit. And he just sort of shakes his head like, nah. And you go, that's not defense, mate. That's not stopping you getting knocked out. Three second round losses in his uh, last four fights. You know, and McCartney, drop some of the training sessions. Do a spin class. We've been talking about sea level Leon Edwards as a mythical fighter. But how about low intensity sustained state Maquan McCartney? But that's all I've seen so far. I'm going to be back for the boys on the boycast uh, on Wednesday, Thursday. I'll have seen some of the other fights by then. We'll talk about that. This weekend's UFC event, whoa, it's not great. Um, the main event is, you know, as we're always saying, throw any two uh, ranked bantamweights together. You've got yourself a banger, son. You've got yourself a stew going. Uh, but some of this other stuff, Holly Holm Comain, Andrea Lee, Albert Duraev, a lot of guys I would pay not to watch. Um, but you do have Nate Landwehr back against Austin Lingo, taking taking over from Ricardo Ramos's place there. Uh, Nate Landwehr, I almost gave him the but why not the but why the technical turnaround award. I was so impressed with his performance against um, both Ludovic Klein and uh, that lad from um, what's it called the Kansas Gym, James Krause's Scam Emporium. But yeah, we'll have loads to talk about later in the week. Hope you've enjoyed me pontificating about a. a uh, Title fight that a lot of people are saying wasn't super interesting, but I found interesting because I'm a nerd about fighting stuff. If you want to get in on the boycast, see the extra stuff, read that Tommy Loughran Advanced Striking 2.0, sign up to the Patreon, become a boy, support the podcast. If you want to send an email to the podcast, 
jackslagpodcast at gmail.com. And God knows it's a slow week, so I'm going to answer some of those. And if you want to see what I'm writing anytime, fireprimer.com. I am your boy, Jack Slack. Reliably informed that Mohammed Makayev threw some strikes. Bless.